Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Understanding Your Emotional Self Presented by Jesus on the 24th of May 2014 in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. This is session 3, part 1. Yeah. How are you guys? Yeah. Um, this week we're going, to in, in, we're going to continue with our discussion that we started last time we were here, which is all about relationship with God and understanding your emotional self. So you could call this session uh, Relationship with God, Understanding Your Emotional Self, Session 3, and tomorrow will be Session 4. Does that make sense? Now, as you would have noticed, we've also been doing a lot of things uh, where we've been adding frequently asked questions about emotions in the last few months as well to YouTube. Um, Elena and Igor and myself and Mary have been very, very busy doing that. Uh, we've added around 60 hours of material in the last couple of uh, months to, to our YouTube channel. And we're going to continue doing about 25 to 30 hours a month for the next six months of material. Um, mo a lot of it will be about emotions, but mostly what we're trying to achieve is to get many of you who are coming to the assistance groups ready for the assistance group. <laughs> so we don't have to go through a lot of um, information and material that's not relate, you know, that, that we've already covered sort of thing. So that's what we're doing. So the... The session today is going to first uh, revolve around re reminding you about some basic principles from our last two discussions on, for, the, for the, what was it, in February, I think, we were here last doing some discussions. And, and then what we would like to do is present some more material on the subject of emotions and understanding your emotional self and how it impacts upon your relationship with God. Sound all right with you? Okay. Now, tomorrow, we're going to, if we, if we don't get all of the material that I'd like to cover done, done today, then what we'll do is we'll present some of that material tomorrow as well. But tomorrow, we want to focus more on your questions and answers. So, in other words, answering questions about understanding your emotional self personally. That's what we'd like to probably cover more today. So, what I'd like you to do with your questions today, if you could focus them more upon the subject material that we're presenting and questions that you have about that material specifically. And then tomorrow, what I would like is for you to ask questions about your emotional self from a personal perspective. And we can discuss more of those kind of questions tomorrow for those of you who are here tomorrow. Does that sound all right with, with you guys? Okay. So, it's understanding... Your emotional self. Let's do a bit of revision. What can you remember from last last presentation we did on the subject? Nothing? <laughs> Karina wasn't here, but she might remember something. <laughs> let's, uh, let's hand her up, Mike, around. We need to be 100% emotional self, and it's not focusing on the process, but that is the destination. Okay, so that was an important point, wasn't it? That it's not a process of going through emotions, but rather becoming an emotional being, which is completely different from each other, isn't it? So, so what we want to do is write that down first. So it's not a process. <coughs> um, And by, by that, what we're saying is that becoming an emotional being is the destination. And that's a very important thing to remember, isn't it? So now, I don't, how did you go in the last three months experimenting with that? Did you attempt to experiment with that at all? Yeah? It was mixed for some of you? How, how, any personal feelings about trying to experiment with that? Can you see, 
how shut down we are to doing to being that. We sort of treat emotions as if it's something that is an aberration in our life rather than something that is some that that is or should be occurring all the time in our life. Yeah. So um, if we go to Eloisa. Yeah, I find it um, pretty interesting of how how afraid I am of my own emotional expression. Yes. Like how much fear and how many false beliefs and how much is tied up and stuff. Yes. Um, and also the difference between different people. Yes. Um, like so people. when you're with some kind of people, you're more emotionally expressive and then when you're with others, totally, totally different. And, and really attempting with the ones I found really hard to be more open. Yep. But then found out some pretty, uh, what I feel, <laughs> judged quite harshly things about myself. Yes. In those situations. Because so, of how I become. So you, can, did you work out in that process why you shut down yourself so much with those people? Some of them. Yeah. Um, at, could, at what I figured out. Uh, and so and could you see the relationship between their projection at you about your emotions and you shutting down your emotions? No. Yeah. No. What I kind of be, uh, realised often was that I was... I was projecting stuff at them right. that wasn't necessarily from them. It was just that certain thing. So you, know, you it, believed they would do certain things yes. that they didn't do. Yep, and it yep. was sort of like exposed in me, especially with women, Yes. Um, about things that I am expecting from my mum, mm -hmm. like that have happened all the time. And so now I just go, every woman's going to potentially be like that. Yes, so there's a belief now inside of yourself emotionally that every woman who's a certain type of woman will respond in that way towards you. Yes. And those are who I attract. And, and so it was quite interesting to then realise that. Yep. And then the projections from them, I kind of tried to focus more on what was coming out of me. Yep. And, and did I really want to love my sisters or not? Yep. And for a while I didn't. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I have to say it's touch and go at times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so, so you started to see the relationship between what, you shutting down your emotions with different people and sometimes it was about your beliefs about them. And sometimes, also I point out to you, probably that you haven't reflected on it, sometimes it's about their projections at you. Yeah. You see? So, so once you start allowing yourself to be emotionally sensitive, you start realising what's actually going on. And, and you start feeling the truth of most interactions much better. And that was something I noticed, is I, I don't, I, like what you said, of like, our perception of how everything is is completely false and we have no idea. Yep. And I would take an action and then something else would happen or I'd have a tiny cry or go and like, I go and talk to myself. Yeah. Talk to God about it. Yeah. And I'm like, no, this stuff not wrong. <laughs> yeah. And after that, it was like, oh, hold on. I could at least feel my stuff in that. Yes. And it was kind of clearer and I didn't have that same crap going on for that person anymore. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. You can see that. So you can see it's coming, a lot of yeah. it's coming out of you or out of your beliefs. Totally. Yeah, which are all emotional. Yeah, which yep. is great. Yeah, that's good. Anyone else like to make some other comments? If we go just straight behind to Sue. I just noticed in myself the um, <coughs> desire to run away rather than... Yep. Rather than face the music. How many work. of you noticed that after the session? Yep. Desire to run away from your emotions. Yeah. It's a very common thing, isn't it? No, I've been, I've been working on that one, but I, I feel even yep. after last night, <laughs> I still have that desire to just disappear and yep. fade into oblivion. Basically. So could you feel your fear about emotion? Yeah. See, in amongst your fears about emotion are a whole heap of false beliefs about yeah. emotion. Yeah. And unfortunately, the world we live in all generally has this same level of false beliefs about emotion. You know, uh, it's interesting when we talk to media people or talk to people being interviewed because most of them accuse me of manipulating other people's emotion. One thing that... They're became, so afraid of it. Yeah, mm. One thing I really noticed in myself was uh, that I have that same feeling even in joy and when I'm sharing. Yep. So it's... It's really strange because you'd think that that would be the time you'd want to st stick around. And it, actually, yeah. for me, it's not. No, no, unfortunately it's not. We, we, are, we are so judgmental of any emotions beyond a certain norm. Yeah. This, that's reality. So, so you could say there's a certain level of, you could say, pessimism, right? How do you spell it? <laughs> it's not right. Is it? And then there's a certain level of optimism. Yeah. 
that we allow in normal society, what we call normal society. Now, anybody who swings beyond either, that's the not allowed emotion. Yeah. Right? So that's the not allowed and that's not allowed. So it's like if I was feeling really happy, I'd pull back on that. I could feel myself because it didn't seem safe to be really happy when yep. someone else wasn't being happy. Yep. <laughs> and, yeah, just what you're saying. Yeah. I was observing that a lot. Yeah. And can you see how this even relates to medical practice and all sorts of things? A person who is really, really happy is thought to be sort of manic or over the top, and sometimes they are. Sometimes they are influenced by spirits yeah. to do that, but other times it is a real state. And then the person who's lower than just what the average person is, we, we call that depression or... You know, yeah. and then we need to medicate people on both ends of the spectrum. I also find that with, um, with certain people that it's like they won't, don't like giving you permission to be anything other than bubbly and wonderful. And like Correct. You, it, I was observing that as well. If I, if I happen to say, well, things weren't absolutely wonderful today, um, with some, in some cases, certainly not in all, but in yeah. some cases I noticed that there wasn't a permission, or I didn't feel a permission to be like that. Yeah. How do you spell neutral? Right. So anything above the neutral zone, some people will not just let you go there. And then other people will not let you go to anything below the neutral zone. But I, I think it's equally I won't let myself go there either. Well, well, it all begins with what other people will allow and your fear of what other people will allow. That's why you don't do it for yourself. Does that make sense? Now, so, so, for example, in your childhood, you weren't allowed to go into sort of any negative emotion, like maybe grief or something like that. So, so what we're taught is we're not allowed to go there. We're not allowed to go there. And I find it quite interesting watching movies sometimes nowadays. Everyone has all this built-up emotion, even in the movies, and they never allow themselves to experience it. They just need to have a big cry. And nobody wants to have a big cry. Even in the movies, nobody wants to have a big cry, let alone in real life. Um, no, and, and I find that that's quite interesting, really, in a lot of ways, because the, the movies often reflect our lives in terms of what we allow as a society. And, uh, and we often do not allow the expression of any emotion beyond what we classify as the norm. Yep. Now, that all began way, way... In our childhood, that's all, all, all began in our childhood. Can you, can you see that? And it was all stuff that we need to undo if we're ever going to be in this emotional place with God. Yep. Okay. And um, there was... Uh, I was going... Yep. I was going to say... Um, Sorry, I can't remember or I can't speak. Yeah. One thing I notice happen quite a lot when we start talking about emotions is you often get spirit influenced into speaking or not speaking. You know, even the sensitivity to spirit control is often demonstrated by discussions with emo about emotion. Because a lot of spirits don't want you to talk about certain things that you might become aware of in the process. Does that make sense? So that also occurs. Do you remember? I'm sorry. I bec I've become more aware of seeing what I've created and being able to see the, how strong the false beliefs are, how strongly they're affecting me and being able to see through those a little bit and yep. um, realising... the effect of spirits on me, my opening to spirits, and, and then seeing how I can change some yeah. of that effect. It's taken me a very long time. It yeah. still is. Yeah. But to... Do you see that every bit of spirit influence is actually driven by an emotion you don't want to feel? So we can't really blame the spirits for influencing us when we're in a place of wanting to avoid a whole heap of emotions. And, of course, they will then manipulate those emotions, just like anyone on earth would manipulate probably the same emotions. Yeah. 
Sometimes it takes me quite some time. I can recognise that that's what's happening to me. Yeah. But it can take me really quite some time to get out of that state. Yes. And I have to really pray. I sort of scream. Well, the only way to get permanently out of the state is to actually work through the emotion that causes the state. And you're not willing to do that at this point. So, of course, you then go to God and pray to God, please help me out of this state and so forth, but you're not yet really wanting to get into the emotion that causes the state. Does that make sense? If you got into the emotion that caused the state, then you'd rapidly get out of the state and you wouldn't go back to it because the emo once the emotion is gone, there's no opening to, to have that influence anymore. Do you follow? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm seeing it from different angles because so, sometimes I feel, oh, I can let myself feel that, first of all, with intellectual recognition, but then sometimes I feel that I have gotten through that a couple of times and write a letter to myself because a light bulb goes on, but yes, I don't have it in a consistent way yeah. because I'm, there is something I'm still not understanding, so... Well, this is where you've got to be very careful and this is something I want to talk with you all today about what you convince yourself you've already dealt with. See, to me, anything that's inconsistent means you haven't dealt with it. Right? So I don't, say, I don't go, oh, one day it's like this and the other day it's the opposite, so that means on that day I dealt with it. No, you haven't dealt with it. <laughs> you haven't dealt with it at all if it's inconsistent like that. Once you deal with something permanently in your soul, there's no inconsistency anymore. None. <clears throat> so, so if there is inconsistency, it is directly because of you're not having found the real cause of the problem emotionally. Mm. Yep. Um, if we come across to Laura. <clears throat> um, mine was a bit similar to Susan's, but I just for the past three months, um, just... Getting, getting to the point of recognising the fear of getting overwhelmed, mm -hmm. like uh, praying about it, it, it starts to come up, the overwhelm, and, um, and then I'm left with the false belief and um, also the images that I get shown of, like, my sternum's going to crack or, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like a physical, like, I'm going to get overwhelmed and something's going to, like, snap. Something's going to break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, it's, and then I sit there and go, my heart is not going to break my sternum. It feels like this physic it's a physical hurt of that I'm um, I'm small and the emotion's too big and something is going to break. Yeah, and, and they are all false beliefs, obviously. God created you with the ability to feel every emotion that's right now yeah. stored within you. So, so the fact that it's in you means that you can feel it. And so my question would be though, is because in that moment I do hear you say, like I, you know, intellectually I'm. Um, it's impossible and, and, you know, I'm understanding, you know, that, it's, that it is literally impossible. Yep. So um, the next question that I ask myself is why do I fervently want to hold on to this false belief when it's completely illogical, it's, there's no person on the planet that's ever cracked a sternum or broken a heart <laughs> from feeling. It's like what is my investment when I'm so unhappy holding on to this emotion when I could just let it overwhelm me and feel such release. Mm -hmm. And the investment is your fear. You're afraid of some things that you don't want to address or deal with. It's not just the fear of being overwhelmed. There's an, all the other sets Correct. of fears. Correct. There's fear that your life might change. There's a fear that all your relationships will change. And the reality is they will. And your life will. That's the reality. If you address things emotionally, everything in your life will change from where it is today. Many of you don't want that. Even if it changes to the better, many of you don't want that because you're so afraid of better and you don't really trust that better is a possibility. There's little trust and faith in God. So you don't believe God's good. You don't believe God's universe is good, not going to be good to you at least. And so, of course, there's all these false beliefs and fears that are all fear-based. So while I'm thinking that that false belief is sort of deeper, it's actually right capping right up on the surface. Correct. Most of our fears are right up on the surface. We just try to ignore them. We use techniques and addictions to ignore them. That's why we create addictions, is to ignore, ignore all of our fears. And the only way to get through them is by feeling the fear emotionally, and most of us don't want to do that. That's the, that's the main feeling we don't wish to feel, fear. Right? Fear is a hard feeling to feel, but it's not impossible to feel. It's just a feeling. 
Yeah? Like every other feeling, it's not impossible to feel. But for most of us, we believe it's impossible to feel. And we've been taught that it's impossible to feel. You think about your parents. Most, both of them probably taught you that it's impossible to feel fear, impossible to release fear. They acted like it was impossible to release fear in their day-to-day -day life. That's how they taught you. And, and if you think about your parents, Laura, that's exactly... Your dad acted like that and your mum acted like that. So, of course, you then believe it's impossible. Internally, it's a belief. And you're going to have to go through that belief... So as that, an emotion. And that physical pain is because of the emotions that are underneath it not wanting to come out, so that the resistance... Uh, see what you do. Oh, okay. Do the emotions want to come out? Uh, they, I'm sure that they're created to come out, but I'm stopping No, but No, see, whenever you say the emotions inside of me don't want to come out... Oh, no, I don't. What have you just done? Yeah, taken the power away from my will. Okay, you're basically saying you're not responsible for the emotions coming out. Yeah. You are. I'm totally Yeah, and this is one of your false beliefs. You want somebody else to be responsible for the emotions coming out of you. You don't want to have to take responsibility personally for them to come out of you. You see, and this, this is all based around some unfairness that exists within you, feelings that somebody else put them there, so somebody else should take them away. So that's anger, and there's an unwillingness to feel that anger. You feel that somebody else put them there so somebody else should take them away. You shouldn't have to do it. Right? Okay. And, that, and whenever you say they're not ready to come out, all you're doing is suggesting that it's got nothing to do with your own will. And it's got everything to do with your own will. And that's something we're going to discuss today. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, you know, actually understanding your emotional self, one of the things you're going to need to understand in that place is how to use your will. It's a very big, very big part of that. We gave a talk, I think it was a couple of years ago now. It wasn't really a talk, it was more an interview between myself and Mary at Mergen about uh, free will. And, that, and in, in that talk, the majority of people in the audience found it very difficult to listen to that talk because the majority of us find it very, very difficult to engage positively our own will. We want, we want somebody else to come and fix things for us. Why, why do you think the Christian faith has had so much success with the concept that Jesus died for your sins? Because you don't, yeah, you don't have to do anything. You, and and the most, most people on earth don't want to have to do anything. They want somebody else to do it for them. That's what they want. And when you say things like, the motion's not ready, you're just saying basically that you have no understanding of your own will. Because it, it, the emotion will come out when you are desirous of the emotion coming out. That's when it comes. It doesn't come under any other circumstances. Yeah. And that's a part of understanding it too, the emotional self. Okay, now what else did we discuss last time we got together? Can you remember? Fab, you so you, we talked about when you feel the emotion, that's the emotion to work on in that moment. Yes. So being present with that emotion that's there. Yes. So once we, once we threw out the idea that we're going through an emotional process and we, when we come to acknowledge that it's not an emotional process, we are becoming emotional beings. In other words, it's what we're going to end up in as a state. We're going to be emotionally emotional. Can you see automatically that changes your focus, doesn't it? When you come to feeling emotion, you don't, you don't, under those circumstances, you wouldn't go oh, I just want to be over this emotion. Now, the majority of us are still doing that when you think about it, aren't we? When a negative emotion comes up, what's the feeling you have? I just want to be over this. Right? Whereas a person who's in the true state at the soul level, understanding their emotional self, they would say, I want to go through this rather than be over this. Yeah? yeah? That makes sense? So... if you had a question? Bring the mic. In regards to being emotional, I find that I get frustrated when I'm not now. Mm -hmm. Now knowing to be an emotional being. And, and in saying that, though, when I do get to the state of emotion, I feel as well that I have a lot of blockages and resistance in that. Yep. And I also get frustrated with that too. And okay. not understanding how to work through that is... So what's frustration? Insane. It's an anger. It's an anger, yep. Very good. And what's anger? Frustration. 
It's an emotion, isn't it? It's an emotion. <laughs> right? So when you feel frustration, you're not allowing yourself to feel anger. Now, if you're frustrated, generally, who are you frustrated with? Myself. Yourself. So it's anger with yourself that you need to let yourself feel. Why are you so angry with yourself? Why is anybody angry with themselves, do you think? Anybody have an idea? If you just go to Dave behind. I find I'm generally angry with myself when I have expectations of myself to be reaching certain goals or something like that, like I have a lot of judgment around. And why would you have those expectations? To meet other people's expectations. Of course, at some point, somebody else had to told you, tell you that those expectations were realistic, right? Somebody had to train you into that, right? So when you're angry with yourself, really what you're doing is, is blaming yourself for what somebody else taught you. You'd be far better off thinking about what they taught you or feeling about what they taught you would be even better. Does that make sense? than blaming yourself for what they taught you. It's not your fault that you were taught these things. So whenever you get angry with yourself about it, you're really saying it's all your fault that you got taught these things and that you're now in that state. And, and that is a self-deception self emotion. So you can stay in that state of anger and frustration with yourself for years and years and years. Right? And you're doing it because you don't want to have an internal sense of who is responsible for this state. And the person responsible for that state are the people who taught you to have that state, who taught you to blame yourself, who taught you to attack yourself, who taught you to treat yourself badly. Does that make sense? And as a result, they are the people that you're unwilling to feel about. And there's a reason. You're afraid. You're afraid to feel about what other people have done to you, and so you would rather... Blame yourself. And that's really all that getting frustrated with yourself is. It's just blaming yourself for something that somebody else taught you to do to yourself. Yeah. It's not very fair, is it, if you think about it? It's like me saying, it's like myself t t treating Mary badly, so I'm abusive to her. And then I also tell her that she's to blame for me being abusive to her. And then she comes to believe that, so she now blames herself whenever I'm abusive to her. This doesn't feel very fair, does it, to Mary? Right? Wouldn't it be better if she recognised that I'm the abusive person <laughs> and I'm the one who did these bad things to her and that, and that all she needs to do is feel her grief about that? That would be a better course of action. In our upcoming assistance groups, we're going to be looking at a lot of these kind of dynamics where we often blame ourselves in preference to um, actually placing the responsibility for what we were taught onto the person who taught us. Now, God always places the responsibility of what we were taught onto the person who taught you. And for most of us, that's our parents. Mostly it's our parents who taught us to shut down emotionally. They taught us how to do it. They, they physically enforced it, generally, through violence or at least through verbal and emotional attack. And, and then we grow up blaming ourselves for what they did. <laughs> it's not very fair. And we'll talk a little bit today about what's fair for our ch inner child, if you like. And I don't like using that term that much, but... Um, because really we are who we are, which includes all of our childlike uh, and, and hurt child emotions. But we're going to discuss a bit about the hurt child today and getting in contact with the hurt child. Okay. So is there anything else you can remember from our discussion? I've got the notes here, so it makes it easier. Yes, thanks. Uh, Catherine? If we don't become an emotional being, we won't be able to have a relation with God, relationship with God, yep. or we won't be allowed to, able to have a relationship with anyone or anything at all. Correct. So this is a very, very important thing, isn't it? So, so the way is only possible if we're emotional. So the way to God, the way to yourself, the way to any relationship is only possible if you become 
an emotional being all the time. And when you think about it, that makes sense, doesn't it, from a logical perspective? How, how do you know someone who's just a blank, like, emotional page? And, you know, you don't get anything from them emotionally, they don't receive anything from you emotionally, they're just detuned emotionally. Do you feel like having a relationship with that kind of person? Generally not, right? <laughs> Unless you're exactly the same, you probably wouldn't probably want a relationship with that person. Can you imagine, you, can you imagine living with your partner and they don't like, they don't either like you or, or dislike you, they have, are completely ambivalent towards you, they don't want to have sex with you, but they don't not want to have sex with you, they have no real passions and desires, they no, have no longing for your love or for receiving it, why would you be with them? Can you see it's pointless having a relationship with such a person, isn't it? Because you're not really having a relationship, you're just having a cohabitation. Yeah. No emotion is flowing. Once emotions flow, now we're, in, in, we're beginning to have a real relationship of some kind. Yep. So every relationship in our entire universe is going to have to, at some point, become emotional in its nature. And that even includes relationship with the environment that we have around us, in fact. Right? We will have feelings for our environment which our environment would be able to feel. Now, while our environment might not have a soul, the only people that have souls are humans, but we, we can also sense the environment's distress. Right? We can sense its pain, and that's what also causes us then to become sensitive to the environment and what we're doing to it. So even that won't happen without some emotional connection. What else did we discuss? Can you remember? Similar along that vein. How has God designed the universe with regard to knowledge? Uh, Louisa? The more of God's love you receive and the greater you do, the more knowledge just comes to you automatically. Okay, so can we say then that we will not be knowledgeable until we learn to become Emotional. And didn't we talk a bit about that, about the intellect? I remember saying about how, uh, it hit me, especially women, that all of us are kind of trying so hard to be intellectual and are trained in this way when actually our true natures are emotional. Yes. And so we're very far from who we really are. Correct. Yep. Correct. Anything else you can remember from last discussion? Yeah, but that, that's just parroting some things there, Ken. I, I, I can't go there with you. Yeah. Um, I really got um, this. I bought a don't believe everything you think, <laughs> uh, which follows on from that last point. That's a good book, isn't it? And I Can kind I have my glasses of, out? kind of realised pretty much everything I think is this construction and um, that we also have to be real. Yes. With God and with everyone else rather than trying to be something that we're not yet. So remember we spoke about your thoughts being totally distorted by all of your unhealed emotions and belief systems that are all emotional. Thanks, baby. My eyesight's improving, so my glasses are not always... Sometimes they hurt to wear now, so... Um, so that is a very important fact, isn't it, that we need to bear in mind, that it is true that what we think is not often very real at all. Yep. And that frustration that, you know, I don't want to be the person that I am now, yep. but I, you know, I have to embrace that I am that way. Correct. I'm loving things about me and I, you know, destroy the environment around me. Yep. Because I don't want to feel them, you know? So. Correct. So we need to, if we're ever going to get to a state of humility, we have, to, we have to acknowledge all of the emotions that are within us at this point in time. The majority of us don't do that. We try to deny that we have a whole heap of negative things going on inside of us and we, try to own, and we only accept we have a whole heap of other things, you know, things that are actually many times just our facade that are not even real. 
And we often are telling ourselves a whole heap of messages intellectually that are completely the opposite to our true emotional feelings about ourselves and others. And the worst thing is a lot of those things I think that were good about me are actually just huge addictions and exactly. projections at other people. To and sometimes it's also the opposite. A lot of the things that you feel are bad about you are actually, from God's perspective, good. Mm. Right? Yeah. And we have a complete distortion about all of that. Remember we said that most of us have no idea about anything in life really at all, basically. Yeah, I got that. Because we're totally detuned from our emotional self. We don't really know anything. And you can't actually know anything until you have experienced it emotionally. You can't really know anything. So you can parrot divine truth, and many of us have gotten to do this pattern with divine truth of parroting it, but we're not feeling it. And if you're not feeling it, you don't really know it. So what's the point of parroting it? You're just like a parrot. You know, hello, coggy, hello, coggy. You know, that kind of thing is, is the kind of thing we're really doing with divine truth. You know, love, truth, and humility. You know, love, truth, and humility. Sorry, Ken, but that's, that's the parrot of divine truth. But it's not feeling it. To feel it, you've got to go through the emotions involved. And that, that takes a lot more effort and desire to do that and a lot more exercise of your will. Okay. So that was uh, basically everything we think. May be wrong. And I say may because it may not too. You don't know. You don't know until you've gone through the emotional experience and you've actually worked out what is right and what is wrong through the experience. Okay. Now, at the end of the discussion last three months ago, I think it is now, um, many of you felt mo more motivated to actually start looking at your emotions more sincerely. Is that not true? Yes. And yet, many of you haven't done that in the last three months. <laughs> So why is that, do you think? Well, we were motivated to feel more about what's really going on in our life and to focus more on our emotions, and yet many of us haven't done that really. So, so what, what caused, causes us to avoid actually going into it even when we know we need to? What, what's the main thing? Fear. 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 Okay, so, so you start seeing the emotion of fear is our major impediment to growth. And unless you feel the emotion of fear, it will not leave you. Now, this is the problem that I feel most people have, is that we want to ask question after question after question after question after question. And what are our questions really attempting to do? They're really attempting to alleviate our fear. But the only way to really alleviate fear is by releasing fear. And that's what we're unwilling to do. So we can talk and give answers and talk and give answers and talk and give answers to AJ's blue in his face, right? And at the end of the day, it makes no difference to your progression unless you're willing to feel your fear. Now, sometimes giving answers may help you work through the emotions associated with why you don't want to feel fear. But unless it does that, then even answering questions is pointless. We'd be better off just giving you a standard answer. Fear. Feel it. Fear. Feel it. <laughs> you ask a question about, how is the universe created like this? Fear. Feel it. <laughs> because most of, the, most of the answers are not going to enter your soul unless it's an emotional experience. And the emotion of fear present, prevents you from accepting the truth on these subjects. So can you see in the end that part of coming to understand your emotional self is going to be very much and very much revolve around coming to desire to feel your fear. Right. So that's a very different place than forcing yourself to feel your fear. And that's a very different place also to avoiding your fear through addiction. And it's a very different place to avoiding your fear through questions. Right? It's a willingness to actually experience your fear. 
that is going to help you a lot with regard to understanding your emotional self. What I find is the majority of people never get to understand anything about themselves unless they're willing to start to go through the emotion of fear. So one of the things we're going to have to discuss more in the future about is fear. Now, I've already had many discussions about fear. The interesting thing I find about the discussions about fear is that they are the least watched and the least uh, like written about presentations we've ever done. Even the people who are doing the transcribing have not transcribed the talks about fear. If you list all of the talks that they've transcribed, there's quite a lot. There's now 70 or 80, right? And they've only just recently done their first one about fear. What does that tell you? That nobody wants to face their fear. The emotion, feeling the emotion of fear. Okay, so... So, you know, when we start to talk about progression, how can we define progression? Now that we're seeing that progression is all about emotions, how would you define progression now? See, before you might have said growing in love, you know, growing in truth, being more humble. Right, or used all of these basic terms, I suppose you might call them. But all of those things need to have some kind of emo emotional connotation, do they not? They need to have some kind of emotion involved in them. So how would you define progression? Well, perhaps we need to start with how we need to not define progression anymore. How does that sound? Because we probably, probably all of the ways we're defining progression are probably wrong. So let's list all the ways we currently define progression and we'll discuss whether they are in harmony with our emotional self or outside of it. How does that sound? All right, so what are some of the ways you've been defining progression? So progression is a process. And is it? No, it's not. So down here we'll have to talk about that a bit. What else? If we can use the mic, if we can... David? I used to think that... The more hours of AJ DVDs that I've watched, the you know more progressed I'll be down, and more knowledge I'll have, and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, and that doesn't work at all. Complete intellectual. Yeah. Yeah, completely. And the reason why is because if the soul is not open emotionally to the experience of what's being said, nothing of what's being said has actually entered your soul. So you've made no progression, and and you have this un, uh, this other problem, and that is you think you have. So part part of the problem is that we think we have progressed. And we had come up with heaps of justifications as to how the thoughts, these thoughts arrive. And one of the justifications is, I know more now than I knew before, so I'm progressed. Now, I'm saying you don't know until you felt something, so that's not even true. You don't know more than you knew before. For many of us, that's the case. We only know if we've gone through the emotional progress, process. That's the only way we know. So, so the reality is you can listen to divine truth for the rest of your life and, un, and re, be able to regurgitate every word I've ever spoken and still know nothing about divine truth. Which is very, very different than going to a university course and knowing something about medicine or going to something about engineering, isn't it? Because all you have to do there is what? Just regurgitate the information. And then they say, you know it. Right? It's not strictly true either. Is that I was talking to the guys last night, I think it was about, and I used the example of a, of a person who goes to, 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 to do veterinary science as a university course. If they do veterinary science as a university course and they're never allowed to touch an animal ever, and they have all this theory, and they come out of the course, well, they have all this theory, but have they ever put it into practice? Has it ever been an experience? Now, would you take your animal along to such a vet? Probably not, right? <laughs> because there's a whole heap of things more that he's got to do before he's going to become a good vet, right? <laughs> Sorry? Sometimes what? 
got to take them, take their animal for him to get some experience. To get some experience. <laughs> but this is where he usually would get his experience initially by having someone else show him the process and actually taking him through the experience in a supervised manner, right? Well, that's what your guides are doing with you. They're taking you, they're attempting to take you through the supervised, and I say attempting, it just depends on how willing you are, but they're attempting to take you through the supervised process of becoming more based around your emotional self, becoming more knowledgeable, really, from an emotional perspective. So thinking we have progressed is a major problem. So what are ways that you would have thought that you've progressed or you, that would justify you thinking that you've progressed? One that we've mentioned is that you know more now about divine truth than you knew before. And what I'm suggesting is, no, that's completely false. Until you've felt it, you don't know it. Uh, Teresa? Um, things in your life seem to be getting better. Seem to be getting better. Um, can you be more specific? Well, See, I know when things in my life are better <laughs> and I don't have this feeling that it seems to be better. Well, like you were saying before, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad and... Um, yeah, see, I wouldn't call that better. I would call that the same as before. You see, it? Like you, the reality is you will know th things in your life have improved. There's a difference between knowing and just thinking. See, most, most people go, oh, last week there was three things that happened to me. It was so good at showing me that I'm progressing. And there was 25 things that happened to you that should have shown you that you weren't. <laughs> right? And so what do we do with that? We dismiss all the 25 things and we just say, those three things, that shows me I'm progressing. Isn't it wonderful? And we convince ourselves because we love self-delusion. We love self-deception. Why do we love self-deception? Because it stops us from having to feel emotions of fear. So my feelings are you should know when you have improved on an issue. And you will know, actually, when you've improved on an issue. You will feel very, very different, very different when you've actually improved on an issue. Law of attraction events are a great way of finding out what you're really attracting. They're a great way of finding out. So if you find your attractions improving in some areas, then you know that you must be dealing with something and on the right track. But if you don't know what it is you dealt with, then I'd suggest that that's probably not a good sign <laughs> that anything's really been dealt with. Because you will know. You will know what you've dealt with as you progress. Anything else? Sorry? Uh, Ken, wait for the mic. And put up your hand. <laughs> yep. Motive? What do you mean by motive? Having the desire to... How do you, how do you say... Are you saying your motivation is more pure? Or how, how are you measuring it? This is, we're measuring progression here. Yeah. Uh, Fab? Um, it's measured for me, I feel it's measured by how softer I am after an event uh, has happened, like I feel softer and then the law of attraction brings something and that's not affecting me the way it did anymore. I've had more compassion yep. than before. Yep, certainly. So what would be the opposite of that? The opposite of that is thinking that my law of attraction has changed or... When it hasn't really? Yeah, and um, telling myself that I'm better with this event as it comes up next. Yeah. And, and the fact that it's coming up next means that you're probably not better with the event because the way the law of attraction works is that once you've stopped the problem in your soul, you don't attract the same events anymore. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you're attracting the same event again, with just with a different, like I often say, with a different face on it or a different yeah. you know, person involved, but you're still attracting the same kind of event, then it probably means that you haven't dealt with anything <laughs> and you just think you have. Yeah. Right? Yep. Anything else you can think of? Um, not doing certain behaviours and believing that you're good for not doing that when you, you know you haven't dealt with, or you don't, you think that you, you haven't dealt with the underlying causes. Like, for instance, right. meat. Yep. Like, I don't eat meat, but I know I haven't dealt with the emotion. Correct. Because there's still desire there. Yep. And so what would you like call that? That? that would you, what would you call mm. that? Taking an action without any real emotional change inside of your soul, wouldn't you? So it's so, like so acting better yeah. and trying to act better. Trying to be a good girl. Trying to girl. be a good girl or a good boy. <laughs> um, but really, nothing's really changed from an emotional perspective and you know it. Yeah. Yep. 
And there are many times when we don't even know it, but we keep attracting the same events and we keep having the same feelings. So, for example, there's people who have stopped drinking alcohol, but they still feel like drinking alcohol. Mm. So there's two people who have stopped having a cigarette, but they still feel like having a cigarette. And what's worse, though, is that I'm starting to realise, for instance, um, I've been celibate for nearly three years, mm -hmm. Um, but now I've realised, you know, thinking I was good. Yeah, good But girl. then I'm doing all this stuff in the sleep state. That yeah. I've just realised. So I'm quite deluded. Into thinking that you're being a good girl, really. Yeah. Like, this is not a good girl. Like, you're just doing it in a state where you can deny that it's happening in your awake state. Yeah. Yeah. And that's very common. Very common. And that's driven by the fact that you've tried to change without actually emotionally changing. And many of people do this with divine truth. They, they treat it the same as ever any other like, faith or religious-based learning. They think that all they have to do is follow the law and the rules and then everything will come good. Well, no, that's not the way it works, actually. Everything comes good when your emotions of not following the laws or the rules are gone. That's when it comes good. Yeah, and for many of us, those emotions still exist because we're unwilling to feel them. We're afraid of feeling them. Good idea. Any other ways we think progression? So can I just ask, who makes the judgment of whether we've progressed? Well, so what, what would be your answer generally? Who makes it? Well, most of us would prefer to do it personally, yes, which means that today I'm really, really great. I'm already at one with God. <laughs> Sorry, if we can have the mic. <laughs> if I'm honest, it's my parents. It, it's what I think. Like, it's like I go back to this place and it's what I think my parents would think is progress. And yes. That is what I generally live by of yep. whether I'm good, bad, Indifferent, whatever. Yes. And uh, why is that? Because that's what you grew up with in terms of the judgment, isn't it? Yeah, and so, approval. I like, and, I'm really big on wanting their approval. And so really I ask others whether I've progressed or not as well, rather than me. Yes. So, so the reality is who really determines whether we've progressed? Isn't it? From, the proper person to determine is God, isn't yeah, it? God. Okay. So, so let's look at who... So let's look at what God thinks and then compare that with what mum and dad, our parents, think. Right? What normally happens there? Like, well, they're two different things. Totally different things, aren't they? Yeah. Totally different things. And so the majority of us accept this as progression, whatever they would say is progressing. So being a good girl or a good boy, that's progression. You know? What, what did they have to do to get you to be a good girl or a good boy most of the time? Violently harm, you, violently harm you. In other words, they didn't, it wasn't your will that you became a good girl or a good boy. It was their violent fear of their violent harm that caused you to be a good girl or a good boy. Many of us are engaging that with God. We're afraid that God will somehow punish us or hurt us or some of God's laws may make, us, make our life worse and that's why we're becoming a good girl or a good boy. And all of those, that kind of progression is not progression because it's all intellectual. Nothing changes emotionally and nothing changes with our desires and our passions. Nothing changes at the core of our being. Yeah. What we need to do to, prog to really measure our progression is to understand that really it's all about whether God feels we've progressed. And how does God measure progression? Reflecting, it's reflected to us through the operation of God's laws. No. How does God measure our progression? By love. What, what love? How loving I am. How loving my soul. you... Yes, how loving you become and? And how loving I am to others. Yes. And how loving I am towards God. Yes, and? One more. How loving I am to myself. Uh, yes, but that oh. was... All right, okay. Keep going. To the environment, to every living thing. Yes, but you've missed out one big one. Oh. The biggest one, in fact. 
Teresa? How much love I have, how much of God's love I have? Received. Received, yeah. Correct. All right, so yes all to all of those things, but that a big one as well, how much love from God that I've actually received. That's the thing that transforms my soul, right? That's the thing that makes my soul grow to become at one with God. And, and from, that's from God's perspective how much you've actually received, not, not how much you think you've received. Right? Some of you think you haven't received any, and you have. And some of you think that you have received some and you haven't. And there's a lot of people in between those two places, right, in terms of their judgment of what's actually occurred. So it's about how loving we've become and how much of God's love we've actually received. That's real progression, isn't it? Okay. Anything else that you can think of with regard to ways in which we've thought we've progressed? If I can give you some examples... Thinking, we know things, we have not felt. A lot of us do that, don't we? Oh, yes. I, like The trouble with listening to divine truth presentations like this is that you come away from it thinking you know something new. And we don't. We only know it when we feel it. And for most of us, we haven't felt it yet. That's the only time we really know it, when we feel it. So if we haven't felt it, and we assume that we now know, can you see the damage we're doing to ourselves? We aren't growing we aren't changing really. We just convinced ourselves we're changing and growing. That's a pretty damaging thing to do because when you convince yourself you're changed and grow, grown and you haven't, right, you're actually self-delusional. Right? It's not a good sign. <laughs> Don't want to become self-delusional on the path to God. You can't become self-delusional. Don't. So in a way, um, we can kind of listen to these teachings and actually build more of a facade around ourselves and actually increase the amount of spirit influence that we can put ourselves under and stuff like that because we think that we've dealt with that issue. So Correct. we want to completely ignore it and then it's just spirits and Correct. avoidance and everything just straight through there. Yes, I've seen many people degrade in their condition since they've been listening to divine truth for that, for that exact reason because they've convinced themselves that they now know things that they don't know and they're acting out of harmony with love in each case and now also acting out of harmony with love towards themselves and their condition to continues to degrade and they think they're improving. There's many people that have done that. Yep. You can see that the trouble with not progressing emotionally is that it causes all sorts of other additional problems. Yeah. Anything else you can think of, Eloisa? We might have said this, but thinking we have felt things that we have not felt. Would yes, that, that's very good too. Would that no come things, under saying no? Felt things, yeah. yeah. Many of us actually uh, prefer to substitute feel, false feelings for true feelings. And so then we tell ourselves we've felt something that we haven't felt. Right. So, for example, many of us want to believe that uh, when somebody has said something to us that we were being attacked by that person, when all that person might have been doing is just telling us the truth. Right. And they might not have been attacking us, but we want to feel that they've attacked us. Right. Because feeling they've attacked us means that we can dismiss everything they said. Can't we? If you feel that somebody has attacked you, you can dismiss everything they said as having any value or worth. Right? There's a great way of avoiding a whole heap of truth. But that, that's an example of how we think we've felt something that we haven't actually <coughs> felt yet. Because the feeling we need to feel is completely the opposite of what we're feeling many times. And all, we've just convinced ourselves otherwise. 
with that attack, though, what I'm noticing, because I'm definitely a dismisser of all attack. Yeah. But lately, I'm like, hmm, sometimes what they're attacking me with, even if they are or they're not, yep. has elements of truth about me in it. Correct. And so I'm kind of just wanting to dismiss it because I don't want to know that. Bit. Yeah, correct. So a lot of the times we're trying to dismiss information, dismiss the truth. And this is why thoughts are not very helpful with our progression because we're often thinking our way through the process, dismissing a whole heap of things that we believe are untrue, but they're actually true, and then accepting a whole heap of things we think are true that are completely untrue. Right? And then we say, because I cried last week, I'm on the divine love path. No, you're not. <laughs> like, there's millions of people, billions of people out there who cry and none of them are on the divine love path. Right? That's the reality. Just because you cry, a lot of times you can cry in frustration, anger, annoyance, rebellion, tantrum, fear. All sorts of crying can be happening. None of it is causal because none of it's real. None of it's real. It's not the real emotion you need to face. So this is, these are traps that we can get into. Yeah. Anything else you can think of? Mary? I've got the handout, so it's easy. But one of the things that's not on the handout that I used to associate with progression was my ability to cope and manage and deal with everything that came my way. I thought, if I, if I can do that cool as a cucumber and emotionless, then I'm quite a developed person. Yeah. And the truth is actually the complete opposite. Once I stop trying to manage everything and control it, yeah. I begin to progress. Yes. Yep. But would you like to hear some more things from the sure. handout? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, having intellectual realisations without accompanying emotional experiences. It's a big one. Yeah, so do you know what we mean by that? Having an intellectual realisation without having an accompanying emotional experience. So a lot of times we have an intellectual realisation. that, Like often we're having discussions with people and they say, oh, yeah, I realised that last week. And did you feel about it? No. But I know what you're talking about. No, you don't, because you haven't felt it yet. And unless you feel it, you don't know. You're just convincing yourself you know because you had an intellectual light bulb moment. You know, those kind of things, those light bulb moments that occur. They're wonderful. I'm not saying that they're not, but they don't mean any progression until you feel about them. That's the reality. <laughs> so have them. Don't, don't stop having them, but... There needs to be further action taken. Yeah. Um, thinking, well, you've kind of covered this. Thinking you know things you don't yep. feel and thinking that you know things you've not experienced. Thinking you know things you've not experienced. Yeah. Yep. So how many of you have experienced a really, truly loving relationship with the opposite gender, if that's the kind of relationship that you're attracted to? So in other words, if you're heterosexual, how many of you ex have experienced a, a truly loving relationship with, a, with the opposite gender where you always felt happy, you always felt great, they always felt happy, they always felt great, you both weren't in addictions at all and you were both in complete harmony with God's love and God's laws. How many of you have had that relationship? Like zero? Okay. Now, how can you say you know what that's like? You can't, can you? You can only guess what that must be like. You don't know. We don't know until we've experienced it. So we can aim for it, but we don't know. Many of us don't even believe it's possible, if we're honest with ourselves. Thinking you are more loving without having an emotional release of unloving feelings. Yes. We deserve this a lot. Where people say, oh, yes, I've worked through this issue, and they've not released the unloving emotion at all. And so, of course, you haven't worked through the issue. The unloving emotion is still there. You can't think yourself into love. Love's an emotion. You can't think yourself into it. It has to be felt into. Analyzing law of attraction events with the mind without emotional understanding or, or connection. Yeah, this is something we notice heaps of this going on. Uh, let's talk about this one a bit more. The analysis. That pen's not that fresh. Art. <laughs> the analysis of law of attraction events intellectually.
So what do we mean by that? Yeah, figure out Laura. Oh, just like, oh, yeah, that happened again because my mum hated me when I was, you know, going into the whole story. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that one. Yeah, and you don't. Like, and you don't. No. Because if you did know that one, there's a pretty good chance you would have felt your way through it at some point. Because to know anything, you have to feel it. You know, it just makes good conversation with other people who just want to talk about it. Correct, correct. It's like we start entering this whole system of what I would call acronyms and what, what, what's the other word for it? Um, you know, where you start banding, banding around all of this acronym type things to fit into a group that all say, you know, so they start going, law of attraction, law of desire, law of this, law of that. This is not how average people th talk and it's also not how I talk, <laughs> Right? And I just wonder why we want to get in those conversations because having conversations makes everybody feel they're progressing and everybody feel they know something and they don't know anything until they actually feel again. So, yes, you, we can do that a lot. Yeah. How many of you have sat down trying to work out what happened last week or last day or this day or, and, and, and try to work it out with your mind without feeling anything? Were you very successful? No. Ha has the event happened again? Yes. <laughs> of course. It's not until you feel through these events and feel your emotions as you're going through these events that you will actually change. You can think your way through them over and over again. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's really going to change. So this is a major problem for most people. They hear about the law of attraction and then they try to work it all out instead of feeling about it all. It's a major issue. Is that why after a while, like now I get quite drained when someone starts talking like that? It's like I can't have conversations you know, and someone goes, oh, last week or this morning. It's like, why are you telling me? Because they don't want to know. Yeah, it's, ta it's taxing on me now. Yeah. yeah, it is taxing. It's exhausting. Like, how are they ever going to truly know what happened unless they feel about it? And you can try to convince them to feel about it and every time they go back to the intellectual discussion of their law of attraction, what they call their law of attraction, not even theirs, it's God's law of attraction operating upon their soul. But when they go back and start talking about that, uh, really all they're talking about is just stuff. Like they're just having conversation without feeling. Like well, I had a really interesting conversation this week with a, uh, a lovely Indonesian man who we've seen only twice. He, and I, 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 I feel he's on the divine love path. We met him first about five years ago. I think five years ago. And uh, he, he, he... It was the first time that he'd ever heard about divine truth, five years ago. We met him again this week for the second time, um, as it turned out. And... Every single thing we discussed, he had to go away and feel about before we could have the next discussion. So we started discussing some interactions he has, has with women. He, he was overwhelmed with fear and terror and went and vomited in the toilet. Now, he did that three times in our discussion about this stuff with women. Come back, talk a bit more, back in the toilet. Come out again, talk a bit more, back in the toilet. Right? And then... We started to discuss some other feelings that he had about himself and he just cried straight away. Right. It's very unusual for me to have conversations like that. But that's the kind of conversations you will have once you start feeling your emotion. Yeah. You will connect to the emotion instantly. So there was very little resistance in him. Right. And it was very interesting for the other people who have been listening to Divine Truth for five years all that time that he's been in Indonesia, other people who were present, they were just like, oh, off he goes, process a bit more, comes back, off he goes, process. And it's like just natural and seamless. So how, he was growing. He, he'd changed in those five years. He'd changed more than most of the people who have been coming along to the sessions for five years. which is interesting. Yeah. And it's because most of them are doing this, analysing all of everything without actually feeling anything. Yeah. So that's a good example of a man who is allowing the connection to his emotional self. 
Yeah. Um, I noticed that it means I'm throwing up, and I think, why am I throwing up for? Is that is it? I don't understand why. Because you're afraid. But can we leave all those personal yeah, questions for tomorrow? Yeah. Yep. Yep. No worries. What's next in the list, baby? Uh, incorrectly identifying injuries, love, or truth, and not understanding the truth of events or your own condition. So it's, again, intellectually interpreting. Yes. What we see a lot of people doing, um, there's going to be some things we're going to present in the, in the assistance group about relationships. There's basically two types of relationships. There's the relationships where people have hurt you, and then there's the relationships where you've hurt other people. Right? And we're going to talk about these two types of relationships and how it, 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 you need to understand them from an emotional perspective in order to understand what kind of feelings you're having. Now, the majority of people want to blame others for hurting them when they haven't and at the same time let others get away with hurting them when they have, when they have hurt them. So can I illustrate that? Each of you have mum and dad, right? Right? Parents, this is you. Who caused most of the emotional suppression in your soul? Your parents. So they caused the suppression of your soul. Okay? So what are you going to have to do with your parents if you want to progress? Eloisa? Make them accountable for what they've actually done to you. Well, that's a part of the process, but I'm going to put it all together under one word. You need to learn to forgive them. And that's going to mean making them accountable for everything that they did. Because you can't forgive someone for something that you didn't believe they did. What, what, you know, you don't believe they did it when they did do it. Does that make sense? So you're going to have to learn to forgive them. You're going to have to learn to go through an emotional process where you feel everything they did. And that means everything they did from God's perspective, you will need to feel. And it's not from your own perspective. See, your perspective is skewed because you're already accepting everything they did. You already believe what they did was fine. So your, your perspective is already skewed from God's perspective, right? We're going to have to learn to forgive what our parents did. And then let's say we have a partner. And because we denied forgiveness of our parents, we decided to actually get our partner to do most of the things that our parents wouldn't do. Right? What's that called? Codependency or... We had a whole heap of addictions. Right? Now, when I'm projecting my addictions at another person, what am I doing? Am I helping them or harming them? Harming. harming them. Okay. So this person, I'm going to have to repent towards. You know what I see happening instead of those two things? I see most people, when this person does something wrong in a relationship, they think they need to forgive them. And when these people do something wrong in the relationship, they want forgiveness. It's completely the opposite of what should be happening. When these people do something wrong, we need to see what they've done wrong and learn how to forgive them, which means going through the truth. We need to accept the truth of what they've done. And then we need to learn how to forgive them by emotionally going through the process. And when this person does something that we think is wrong, we've got to remember that we attracted them because we wanted them to do the things that our parents didn't do. We actually helped create this person being the person they are towards us right now. So when they go and do something, right, in or out of harmony with love is immaterial, we have been a part of the creation of that person by our projections of our addictions upon them. The other person we need to feel 
repentance towards, not forgiveness. And what I see a lot of people doing is forgiving the persons they need to repent towards and, and repenting towards the people they need to forgive. All right? Now, we're going to go through that in a lot more detail in the assistance group. The reason why I brought it up is because the majority of us are, are trying to feel feelings that are not actually true and also trying to feel feelings where we've distorted the truth. And none of those things are going to help us to progress. We have to feel the truth in order to progress. Right? So when I say, your parents did this, and, they, and you say back to me, oh, but they were good people, they did this and they did that, and they tried to look, they did the best that they could do at the time, and all, those, all that stuff you feed me in return is all stuff where you refuse to forgive your parents. You want to believe your parents didn't do what they did. Right? And therefore you're incapable of forgiving them, because you're incapable of even acknowledging what they did. To forgive someone, you first need to understand what they did. And then you need to go through the process of forgiveness of them. And to repent towards someone, you need to know what you did. You need to understand what you did that harmed them. Right? And most of us don't understand. We don't. Right? We don't understand what we did to harm the other person. And so we're not in a repentant we don't have repentant feelings towards the persons. We often want they, them to repent towards us. We want them to be, feel sorry about how they treated us when the reality is we need to be, feel sorry about how we treated them. Does that make sense? And this is a big distortion of the truth. And of course, most people wonder why they're not progressing after that. We can't progress if you try to feel feelings that don't exist. <laughs> That makes sense, doesn't it? And feelings that exist are all based around truth. So unless you're feeling truthfully what actually happened, then it's not going to be a real emotion. And therefore, no progression will occur. Is there anything else in that list? Though? Everyone's a bit harsh on, hard on that one, so we'll go to the next one. We'll no. talk more about that. Yeah. No, you've just summarised... Um, everything about when we're thinking growth and said, if you're thinking growth, when you are placed in a difficult situation, you will revert to your own historical unloving behaviour and feelings yes. unless you exert an extreme force of your own will. So does everyone get that statement? If you're thinking growth and you're not really growing, you will try, try as hard as you can try, but under pressure you will always revert back to the same thing you used to do before unless you exert an extreme force of your own will. Now that's what the majority of us do. And then we believe it's growth. And that's not growth. growth. Real growth is the opposite. When you make real growth, you automatically do things that are more loving without having to try. That's real growth. You automatically become more loving to yourself, more loving to others, more loving to your environment, more loving with God and so forth, as you've grown. That's real growth. Okay. So can we compare the progression that we intellectually assess with true progression? So what, what, what are the signs of true progression? If Teresa down here... Yeah. Just changing what you do without even, I mean, it's natural, it's just... Okay, um, so it's been automatic. Yeah. You've automatically become more loving. Is that not true? Yeah. And you don't even think about doing it a different way anymore. No. More loving and truthful. So how many of you are finding that whenever you're in a situation, now you just automatically blurt out the truth without even thinking? Huh? That's a sign of progression when you do that. 
You just automatically do it. You can't help yourself. Literally, out it comes out of your mouth and, and then you go, Ooh, what's going to happen now? Sometimes you might still feel a bit of fear from that. But it's just automatic. You just can't help yourself from doing it. That's a measure of real progression. That's, that's somebody who's progressed with their acknowledgement of truth and how important it is in their life. They're automatically sharing it. Right? They don't hold back. They don't worry about what everybody else thinks and feels about what they're about to express. They just do it automatically and then they think about it afterwards. <laughs> just like a child would, if you think about it. Exactly like a child would. Yeah? Is there any other ways? Pete? Um, we're truly engaged in our passions and desires. Um, okay. Preferably 100% of the time. Prefer, well, eventually it will be 100%, won't it? So we're engaged. Our true passions and desires. So not our addictions. Most of us are engaged mostly 100% of the time in our addictions, right? It's like that's what we engage. Now, this is what we're saying. This is, uh, true progress is engaging in your true passions and desires and eventually that's going to be 100% of the time. All right? So, so if, if we've talked about something a year ago and two years ago that you wanted to do and it's in harmony with love and you haven't done it yet, have you grown? No, not on that issue. You have not grown. You can talk about it for the next 25 years and you still don't grow from talking about it. You grow by experiencing something. That's how you grow. So you would engage the experience. Right? So all these people who talk about leaving their work to, get another th to do another thing they really love doing, and that 20 years later you ask them, have they done that? And they go, no, uh, because you know, it didn't pay the money or it wasn't this or all these excuses under the sun. Well, they haven't grown. They haven't let go of those fears enough to actually become engaged in their true passions and desires. Yeah, Pete? And also you're going to take personal responsibility for everything as well. Correct. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, so you go... You're not blaming anyone else for your situation or what's happening around you. Correct. It becomes I. It becomes what is my... What have I done here to change this situation? Yep. When you take full personal responsibility, you will grow. You will grow. And going, oh, and saying things like, you said earlier, Laura, saying things like, oh, when I'm ready, that's not taking personal responsibility. You're ready when you desire to be ready. That's when you become ready. Right? So we need to take personal responsibility even for our fears. Instead of going, oh, I'll just automatically, magically be ready to process through that emotion at some point in the future. You'd be better off going, no, I need to find my fears about why I'm not processing that emotion right now. Why I'm not going through that experience and emotionally right now. Responsibility. Responsibility is probably the way to spell that. All right, next one. Anyone else have any ideas? But wouldn't it also be uh, when you're truthful or when you're automatically truthful, you have your, your desire to actually feel the fears of what happens after is growing and it becomes more of a present thing? So how can I explain that, make more sense? Um, you say something to someone because you're not really worried about too much about what they're going to say back because you just blurted it out. But... You learn from the growth of after, like you, you, you grow in your desire to actually deal with the emotion of fear. Can we call this emotionally experiencing events? Is that... Yeah, because sometimes it doesn't happen in that actual moment when you say it, but you're growing a desire to actually deal with it. In yeah, moment. eventually it will happen in the yeah. moment you say it, obviously. But if you emotionally experience what's happened to you every single time, you will not go wrong in terms of your progression. You will be, you'll progress. You'll definitely progress then. Yeah? Laura? It might come under the personal responsibility, but a willingness to um, 
to really see um, the, the darker emotions and how how the subtleties of um, like the violence that you perpetrate on others, whether it be a judgment or how do you um, measure whether you're willing though? When you um, see a lot of times we can talk about oh, I need to be willing about to do this and I need to be willing to do that. How do you know you're willing? When you fit, oh yeah. Somebody said you take, take action. action. Yeah, you take action. A person who's changing takes action. They don't sit there and talk about things. They always take action in cha with change. Yep. Good. Paul? Hey, our, our law of attraction changes? Really changes, yes. Uh, so the, whose law again was it though? God's, God's law. law of attraction. So our attractions, right, so it's our attractions change. And that means our attractions both negatively and positively change. Do you understand what I mean by that? Like, so, for example, let's look at a positive attraction. Let's say before, whenever you got together with a group of people, most of the people there were just sort of pessimistic and down all the time. And you just seem to gravitate, they seem to gravitate towards you every time. Let's say that happened every time you got in a, in a gathering with somebody. And then you notice, after you've dealt with some emotion, that now it's only the positive people who come and speak with you. And the negative ones seem to just automatically leave you alone. Now that's an indication of a true change, in a positive direction, with a positive, and it's positive change. Negative change would be something like, you notice all of a sudden that you're attracting more and more people who are afraid into your life, and are expressing their fears to you and you're becoming frustrated and angry about it. That would be an attraction that's demonstrating that you're suppressing an emotion uh, of responsibility for people who are afraid. Right? Does that make sense? No? See, sometimes our attractions change positively and sometimes they are changed negatively when we're progressing. So when you're progressing, when you, start, when you start to come to understand that many of your attractions are because of what you accept internally, emotionally, you accept attack. Many of you accept attack from other people emotionally. Does that make sense? Once you start addressing those emotions, you're going to get more attacked emotionally while you're working way through the emotion, and that will be a sign that you're progressing on that matter. It won't be a sign that things are worse. It'll be a sign that things are getting better. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, once you've gone through all of those emotions, after that, those people will probably disappear from your life, and that's, that's a sign that you've probably now worked through a lot of it. But while you're working through it, your attractions will ramp up. And this is an indication that you want to work through it. That you, does that, that, and that's progress, isn't it? Wanting to work through something is progress. You see, we start off generally in complete denial. In that place, we're, not, we're totally clueless of who's around us, who's being attracted, what we're talking about, what we're feeling, what they're feeling, and totally clueless of everything. Then we start getting through to some awareness. Once we start to have some awareness, often the attraction starts ramping up because now our soul is saying, give me, give, saying to God and all of God's laws, give me the things I need so that I can work through this emotion. Does everyone get that? And then, of course, it looks like our life's going down the gurgler, but the reality is it's not because we're now seeing what we're attracting. So this is progress. See, many of us measure progress even incorrectly, right? To us, many of us, progress means my life got smoother, and that's not always the case because you need sometimes these other traumatic events to occur in order for you to see certain things, and without those events, you wouldn't see them. Right? So sometimes the change is negative, but it still indicates that you're progressing. <laughs> right? Now, you know what I see a lot of people do with change that's negative? They go, oh, this isn't working. I'm going to stop now. Right? And that's what they do. But they're not seeing what's really happening. What's really happening is that they have made a change inside of themselves wanting to know something 
And now, of course, the law, which is all based, the law of attraction, which is all based around your desire to know things, right? The strength of that law is such that the strength of your desire to know triggers more engagement from the law. The less you desire to know, the less the law can bring to you. Right? For your awareness. Um, Laura? You know how last time we spoke about how you can become at one with God on particular subjects or particular issues? Mm -hmm. Can it be the same with progression in terms of, like, I don't feel that I'm progressing because the, the biggest thing for me hasn't shifted, but then the things that I'm not really, you know, little things are changing around me, but I don't see them as progression because it's not the, the big one. So can it be the same as... Can I, can I give, give you a general answer to this question? Every time you ask a, prog a progression question, there's a fear driving it. Does everyone get that? What's the fear driving it? That I'm not progressing. <laughs> so wouldn't you be better off feeling that fear than me giving you an answer? And if you felt that fear, you would be able to measure when you're progressing. Does that make sense? Yeah? So just be careful of progression questions because what they're really doing is they're masking a lot of fears that you have. Right? You'd be better off feeling that fear that you have and allowing yourself to go through the fear. Then you'll have instant answers to many of the questions. I know when I've progressed and I know when I have not. Right? I can list every issue that I have not progressed on in the last year. And I can list some issues that I have progressed on in the last year. Right? And the reason why is because once you get rid of the fear relating to progression, you will easily see what you've progressed on and what you haven't. You'll be able to measure it accurately. Okay. So would another sign of true progression be your ability to self-reflect um, deepens? Um, yes, but we'd have to say that our self-reflection has to deepen in the same direction that God wants it to go, right. rather than in an opposite direction, wouldn't we? Yes. Yeah. So, so how do you measure that when you're not feeling? That's pretty hard. I don't know. Yeah, that's tricky. Yeah. I don't know how you would measure that. Obviously, if your self-reflection, if you're becoming more, um, if there's more truth available to you about your, your true condition and you know it's truth, then that's an indication of progression. I meant like what Fab, for Fab, Fab, what he was saying, his experience is that he's now walking away from things and he's sort of realising things quicker, so to speak. That, that's all an indication of progression? Yep, definitely. Yep. Mary? Don't need the mic. I just wanted to uh, point out, again, because I've got the hand out, it's easier, yeah. but um, there's seven things on my list mm -hmm. that have not been mentioned. Yeah. And a lot of the things on the list have become very distant from our emotional self. We're down to measuring progress through physical things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just thought to highlight that to the group. Yes. So can we maybe give them a clue? And then, and then maybe that will start opening up another course of discussion about yes, it. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, so this, we're talking about what it's involved in true growth, yeah. true progress, yeah. and how we would become, perhaps. So first on my list is becoming a complete 100% emotional being. Okay. The more emotional I am, Indicates progress. Could I just ask a question about that point? Then? Sure. Or make an observation, I suppose. Sure. Uh, and that is that oftentimes I see people being inauthentically emotional of course. and calling They're out facade progress. facade emotional. Yeah. So in other words, they try to be more emotional, but it's not real. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about real Emotion. And most of you can feel the difference, to be honest. You can feel when you're manufacturing something compared to when it's real. Yeah. 
Okay? You can also generally feel when other people are manufacturing something compared to when it's real. So how many people come up to you and say, oh, how are you today? And you can feel like, they're not really interested in how I am today. Huh? Or they say, could I share something with you? And what's, what's the feeling that I tried to project when I said that then? What's the feeling? Can I, can I pull you down in some way? <laughs> Right. A person who's more emotional would feel, ah, oh, yeah, I just wanted to pull down that person. That's progress for me to see that I just wanted to do that. Does that make sense? So this is allowing yourself to see what your real emotions are and becoming more connected with those emotions. Okay? So that's one way you can see that you progress. Any other ideas? Or do we have to get Mary to read the other six points? Let's do that. Let's fire away with the next ones. Okay. So receiving God's love. I don't think that was on our initial list. Mm. Have you received God's love in the last year? That's an indication of your progression. If you know you haven't, then how can you say you've progressed? Does that make sense? Makes sense, doesn't it? So instead of berating ourselves, see, when we don't receive God's love, we then go where? Where did our parents treat, tell us to go? It's all your fault. <laughs> so, you know, all that self-attack stuff. That's not what we're doing here. We're not trying to get you to go into self-attack. We're trying to get you to see, have I progressed or have I not? And being able to measure the difference between progression and no progression. Now, if I've not received and I've not been aware of receiving God's love in the last year, then I haven't received it. And if I haven't received it, then I haven't progressed in God's love. I might have progressed in other things. But I haven't progressed in receiving God's love. Yep. Catherine? The mic's coming up the side. So if I've had what I think is an emotional release mm -hmm. and I have not received God's love immediately afterwards, mm -hmm. it means that I have not actually had uh, an emotional, it's a facade emotional. Not necessarily. It just means that you have not had a pure longing for God's love afterwards. Oh, right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. To receive God's love, you have to have a pure, sincere longing for God's love to enter you. Now, you think about your relationship with your parents at the moment. Yes. Can you see why you might not have had a pure desire for God's love at this point? Yes. Right? Because there's all sorts of emotions you're working through with your parents, right? Where your mum's been this really nasty character who's, who's abused you violently physically. Your father's been a nasty character who's abused you sexually. And you're working through these emotions, right? Yes. And, and as a result, it's very, very hard for you to have a longing for God when you see God as one of those parents. It's, you see God as having the same nature as one of those parents. As you work your way through, you'll develop the longing. Once you have the longing to receive God's love, after an emotional release, you will probably receive quite a lot of God's love. Does that make sense? Yes. It yes. just depends on whether you had a sincere longing at the time for it to enter you. Yes. Does that help? There's um, still some so, doubts there, Karen. Uh, uh, somewhat, um, because I don't... Think I believe that God is like my parents? No, but when you say you don't think you believe that, I know you don't think you believe it. But I probably do. But you probably do, right? <laughs> Emotionally, because you are not automatically longing for God's love. Yes. So that tells you there must be a reason why you're not automatically longing for God's love. And what would be the only reasons why you wouldn't be automatically doing it? It's because of some belief systems that are out of harmony with the truth about God. Yes, I, I, you, you are right. I believe he's punishing me. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. So after you've had an emotional release, there's still the feeling in you that he's punishing you. Yes. And then, and then of course, you don't have a longing for God's love in that moment. So, of course, even though you've, re you've done some progress on the emotional side, you've not yet received more of God's love because the longing side is still being developed. 
Yes. Yep. Thank you. So you've got to be careful here because sometimes what we're giving you is indications that true progression is being made, right? You can make progress in one area and no progress in others. You can. Right? You can do that. So some of you have made progress with same-sex relationships. What I mean by that is relationships with the people who have the same gender as you and made no progress ever since I've known you with the relationships with the opposite gender. Right? You can do that. It just depends on how you use your will, right? As to which direction you will progress. Right. Shall we read out another? Sure. Uh, becoming a being with more and more loving emotions. This is a great way to measure your progress. Do you feel more loving now or less loving now than you felt before? That's a good measure of progress, isn't it? Yeah. Would that also include the, that you couldn't even do act in an unloving acts as well? Correct. It also, because more loving is responding less to somebody's addictions, isn't it? So if before you used to respond to somebody's addiction and now you don't, that's an indication you've become more loving automatically. And if it's an automatic thing, that's a very good sign that you've become more loving. So like if before, whenever a woman who was afraid come up to you and she started projecting all of your fear at you, her fear at you and you started responding and trying to make her fear go away and do all of those things, that's that what you were doing before, if that's the case. And now you automatically don't do that. You just say, you've got some fear to feel. And then you go off <laughs> somewhere. And she often will think you're, oh, that's not a very nice man. He didn't listen to me at all. But that's her addiction. You've been more loving. Even though she's judged you as less loving, you are more loving. And therefore you've made progress in terms of your loving emotions. Mm. Okay. The other thing is, do you feel love for more things? You can measure that. Do you actually feel love for more things than you did before? If not, then there's a, there's a way you can see that no progress has been made. Would that be sort of across the board too? Like more yes. loving for the environment, more yes. loving for... Yes, but, but honestly, we often make progress in one area and not in other areas. So you might find that you have become more loving in your treatment of women, but at the same time have the same amount of love in your treatment of men that you used to have, and you find that you've got the same amount of love with your treatment of the environment that you used to have. So that tells you that you've made some progress with regard to the aspect of women, but not progress in these other ways. Yeah. But isn't that good? Rather than bad, because you've made some progress, at least. Yeah. Okay, next one. Feeling and expressing feelings and emotions 100% of the time. This is one area where most of us really struggle, right? We often feel the judgment of our emotions. We, we, we don't, as a result, we're often in a detuned state emotionally because we're feeling the judgment of our emotions and we start shutting ourselves down. We're not feeling and expressing emotions all the time. You can feel and express emotions all the time and yet not be at one with God. And it's going to help you immensely to become at one with God if you do that. They have to be your real emotions, not all of the delusion emotions that you... Self-deception emotions, but they have to be real emotion. Right? So you wouldn't be histrionic. Is that a word? Mm -hmm. Histrionic. You know what I mean by that? A person who's a bit of a drama queen, you know, with their emotion. You would probably be feeling most of your emotions in private rather than in public because that's the best way for you to fully connect 100% of the time to all of your emotions. If you need to be talked through emotion before you feel it, then there's fears that you've got to address still. Next one. Responding to events, people and truth in an emotional way. Okay. So your responses 
will be emotional. So you go, I was really angry about that. Does that sound like my response was emotional? <laughs> I really am angry about that. Now my response is emotional, right? That, and that's what you will do. You will respond emotionally. It doesn't mean that you'll project it out to other people, but you will have more strong emotional responses to what happens to every event. You'll, you'll be overwhelmed with joy and you'll cry. Right? You'll be overwhelmed with grief and you'll cry. You, when you get angry, you have to go into your room and have a good yell because you feel angry and you'll let it go emotionally. You won't just sit on it. You feel ashamed, you'll have all these flushes, hot flushes and dis discomfort come over you. You get all sweaty and fearful and everything. That's what will happen. It will happen because this is you allowing the emotion to flow. That's what's going to happen every time. It won't be like you discuss the emotion because you won't be capable of discussing the emotion anymore without feeling that. So you won't be sitting down and having a nice conversation about emotion that you can just discuss every one of the emotions that you felt last week without there being some kind of connection to the emotions themselves. Right? Theresa?